Okay, this is the first uh, uh, video in a series of three on influenza. Uh, in this first one, we're going to talk about some, some broad ideas about influenza, the disease. And then in the second one, we'll be looking at the structure of the influenza virus. And in the third one, we'll be looking at the epidemiology. How does it spread? How does it move around? What is seasonality? What controls these things? And how might we be able to protect ourselves? So if I asked you about influenza and I asked you to list the signs and symptoms, what would you come up with? Maybe take a minute, maybe pause the video right now for a couple of minutes and actually make a list of what you think of as the signs and symptoms of influenza. Okay, go ahead and pause it. All right, I'm going to assume that you paused it. You thought about what you think of as the signs and symptoms of the flu. And here's a list of the most common signs and symptoms of the flu. The tricky part about influenza is that it is what's called a febrile viral illness. And there are a lot of febrile viral illnesses. In other words, the signs and symptoms look very similar uh, from one infection to the next, at least during certain stages, particularly early uh, in the onset of the illness. So how do we distinguish influenza from other uh, infections, that's tricky. Uh, typically what happens is uh, some patients in some facilities get tested and it gets confirmed and then um, we don't have to test and confirm absolutely everybody if the symptoms are looking very similar. But those first few people in a given uh, outbreak or season uh, may be the trickier ones to, uh, to diagnose early on. Influenza usually is sudden onset, uh, usually within an hour or two. You go from feeling just fine to feeling pretty crummy, achy, maybe fever spiking. Within a day or two, the skin goes very pale, sometimes looks even a little bit green. Um, influenza, 99 out of 100 times, is going to cause a low-grade fever. Every now and then, there won't be a fever, and it'll throw you off when you're diagnosing a patient. But typically, there's going to be a low-grade fever, and associated with that will be the, the chills that we're all familiar with, where um, you, you just sort of want to curl up in a ball on your bed, and sometimes you want to be covered up in your blanket, and other times you want to kick it off. And we call those the chills. Uh, because it's a respiratory infection, there's typically cough and sore throat. Let me, let me pause here for a minute with this idea of it being a respiratory infection. If you wrote down on your list of signs and symptoms for the flu, um, stomach problems, gastrointestinal problems, things like vomiting or diarrhea, um, that's a common misconception. And that comes from this societal use of the term flu to talk about what, what some people like to call the stomach flu, which is really just a, a confusing way of naming things. Stomach flu, quote unquote, refers to gastroenteritis. That's usually caused by a variety of bacteria or some viruses, none of them related to the influenza virus. Influenza infects the respiratory tract, either upper and or lower respiratory tract. If it's going to cause vomiting and diarrhea, sometimes we'll see it more commonly in kids than in adults, but it's typically not going to be the dominating feature. It's not an illness that is all about vomiting and diarrhea. There might be a little bit, particularly early on, um, but that's not what the patient is experiencing overall or what defines their illness. If there's days and days of vomiting and diarrhea, we're probably talking about one of the forms of gastroenteritis rather than influenza. So as a healthcare professional, your job is going to be first to educate yourself and then start working through your circle of influence. Educate your family and start educating your patients about the differences here because the confusion uh, is very real and um, it can lead to, for example, um, people getting a, a flu vaccine and expecting that they're not, they're not going to be susceptible to, um, to gastroenteritis because in their mind that's what they were getting vaccinated against. Uh, leads to distrust, distrust of the medical system, distrust of vaccinations, etc. So understanding, disambiguating these, these two terms and, and really just sort of rejecting the term stomach flu and replacing it with gastroenteritis or, you know, if you don't want to you know, sound like you're talking over your patient's head, you can just talk about a stomach bug, but drop this stomach flu idea here because it's a respiratory infection. Because it's respiratory, sometimes there's going to be some nasal discharge or, uh, or sinus congestion. Um, very commonly, though, we see muscle and body aches, especially in the legs and the back. Keep an eye out for that. Uh, if someone's saying, oh, it's just general achiness, if you can't get them to pin it down, it may or may not be flu. But if they can tell you that their legs have been really sore, 
and or their back has been really sore. Along with a low-grade fever, the pale skin, um, some respiratory signs, maybe, maybe headache, certainly fatigue, um, then you may be on to something with influenza. What are the complications and risk factors? The most common complications associated with influenza are going to be pneumonia and other deep uh, respiratory um, problems, inflammations like bronchitis. Sometimes upper respiratory tract is going to get hit like the sinuses or uh, uh, in kids in particular we may see drainage lead to uh, middle ear infection. These are typically secondary infections. It's um, While the, the influenza virus itself may be able to cause pneumonia, often people get uh, pneumonia from a secondary infection that the influenza infection has left them susceptible to. Uh, a high number of people in the United States die from influenza every year in the, the thousands and very frequently that is associated with uh, pneumonia as a secondary infection. What are the risk factors? Who's at greatest risk? These folks um, are either at a higher risk of getting the, the illness in the first place or if they get the illness uh, getting one of these complications. So very commonly uh, we see with influenza as well as many other infections that young children and, uh, and senior citizens are at higher risk both of getting influenza but more importantly of getting complications if they get influenza. Those of us that are maybe middle-aged or student age, um, you may or may not be at a higher risk of getting influenza itself, but when you do get influenza, it's not as likely to cause, uh, for example, pneumonia or bronchitis. It's not as likely to cause a higher degree of morbidity, and you're not as likely to be involved in, uh, in the mortality statistics either, uh, unless you have some of these other risk factors. Asthma, for obvious reasons, uh, leaves people more susceptible to respiratory infections, Heart failure uh, also. Diabetics, unfortunately, are at higher risk for a lot of infections, influenza being one of them. Pregnant women also higher risk of many infections and folks that are overweight. And so those three groups there, the diabetics, pregnant women, and uh, individuals that would be considered obese, um, we really need to watch carefully. And if they do get the flu, uh, they're good candidates for anti-influenza drugs not vaccines. Yes, they'd be great candidates for vaccines prophylactically, but once they've gotten sick, the vaccine is no good to them. Um, but uh, uh, anti-influenza drugs like Tamiflu um, are indicated uh, when we've got high-risk folks like these. How does it make us sick? What is it about this tiny little virus that can make people sick? Well, it invades respiratory tract epithelial cells. Uh, our lungs are highly susceptible. Uh, it tends to start in the upper respiratory tract, and if it, it's given a chance, it will go much deeper into the lungs. Um, it destroys those epithelial cells and causes uh, acute signs and symptoms, localized um, pain, discomfort. But uh, very commonly, much of what we feel when we are sick with influenza comes from our immune response and in particular interferons. As interferons are being secreted by infected cells in order to warn uh, non-infected cells, those interferons saturate our tissues and make us feel really quite crummy, and that can be localized and systemic. And then as we talked about bacterial superinfections, even potentially viral superinfections, these, these superinfections, now don't confuse superinfection with what the media likes to call superbugs. These are multi-drug resistant bacteria. A superinfection simply means an infection on top of another infection, a secondary infection that was made possible by the primary infection. And uh, in many cases, there are superinfections associated with influenza. In particular, we see Haemophilus influenzae bacterial infections in the upper respiratory tract, particularly the sinuses. Uh, associated with it, which is where it got its name. In fact, Haemophilus influenzae was once believed to be the causative agent of influenza, and that's where it got the species name. Um, eventually, people were able to apply Koch's postulates to it and rule it out as the causative agent, though it is a very common co-occurring infection. So that's all I have for you in this video. In the next couple of videos, we'll continue. We'll talk about the actual structure of, of the virions themselves, and then we'll look at the epidemiology of the disease influenza.